All right, once again, turn in your Bibles to the book of 2 Corinthians. 2 Corinthians chapter 1. Uh, this week we'll be finishing the chapter by covering verses 15 through 24. And I've titled this message, All the Promises of God in Christ are yes and amen. This is what the Apostle Paul will tell the Corinthian church in verse 20. He says, for all the promises of God in him are yes and in him amen to the glory of God through us. So what is Paul saying here? He's reminding the church that you can depend on God. God has and will keep his promises because all of the promises of God are fulfilled in Christ. So Paul wanted to let the church know that just as they could depend on the Lord, they could also depend on him as a worker of the Lord. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 1 starting in verse 15. And this is the confidence I intended to come to you before that you might have a second benefit, to pass by way of you to Macedonia, to come again from Macedonia to you and be helped by you on my way to Judea. Therefore, when I was planning this, did I do it lightly? Or the things I plan, do I plan according to the flesh, that with me there should be yes, yes, and no, no? But as God is faithful, our word to you was not yes and no, for the Son of God, Jesus Christ, who was preached among you by us, by me, Silvanus, and Timothy, was not yes and no, but in him was yes. For all the promises of God in him are yes, and in him, amen, to the glory of God through us. Now he who establishes us with you in Christ and has anointed us is God, who also has sealed us and given us the Spirit in our hearts as a guarantee. Moreover, I call God as witness against my soul that I spare you, that to spare you I came no more to Corinth, not that we have dominion over your faith, but our fellow workers for your joy for by faith you stand. So after giving the Corinthians a message of uh, comfort and expressing his gratitude for them, this is what we've covered the last two weeks. Starting in verse 15, Paul tells the church that it was his plan to visit them twice. He talks about this. He intended to leave the city of Ephesus and on his way to Macedonia, he had intended to visit them. Uh, but Paul's plans changed. And apparently the critics that he had in the church, the false teachers and those who have been uh, led astray by them, they took that as another opportunity to paint the apostle Paul as a fraud that you couldn't depend on Paul because he would say one thing and do another. Uh, he would say yes, but his yes ended up being a no. Now this, uh, the reason why Paul didn't come, he explains this to us in verse 23. He said, I didn't come to spare you. So he didn't arrived the first time for their sake. He wanted to give the church a little time to uh, fix some of the problems. So he wrote to them and he wanted to give them time to repent. So uh, this was by no means Paul uh, not fulfilling his word as a man who is just uh, unreliable, that you couldn't depend on Paul. That Really, that was an unfair accusation. So I want to spend the first part of this message, we're going to break it up into to three parts. Uh, the first part of the message, I want to talk about the importance of dependability. And that's point number one, uh, because Paul was dependable. Uh, then point number two, we'll look at how God is dependable. Amen. Can we give an amen to that? God is dependable. And all the promises of God, this is so interesting, all the promises of God are fulfilled in Christ. And then number three, we'll see how the Holy Spirit is given as a guarantee of our salvation. 
that we who are saved, we can depend on God, not only to save us, but to keep us saved. So let's start with point number one, the importance of dependability. Uh, turn at this point to Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5. Again, the accusation against Paul is that you couldn't take him at his word. That he said one thing, he said yes, but his yes ended up being a no. A few weeks ago, you remember when uh, my father gave the sermon, uh, he, to illustrate a point, told us of the trials and tribulations of trying to get a plumber. Remember that? <laughs> we'll be there Monday. Monday came and went. No plumber. Oh, we'll definitely be there Tuesday. Tuesday comes and goes. We will absolutely be there first thing Wednesday morning. What happened? No plumber. Not dependable. They never showed up. So we all understand the importance of dependability. Amen? Look at what Jesus says. Keeping your word. If you say you're going to do something, you need to do it. Look at what Jesus says in Matthew 5.33. Again, you have heard that it was said to those of old, you shall not swear falsely, but shall perform your oaths to the Lord. But I say to you, do not swear at all, neither by heaven, for it is God's throne, nor by the earth, for it is his footstool, nor by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. Nor shall you swear by your head, because you cannot make one hair white or black. But let your yes be yes, and your no, no. For whatever is more than these is from the evil one. So you can see the similarity between this statement and what Paul is talking about in 2 Corinthians 1. Yes, yes, no, no. So let your yes be yes and your no, no. What does that mean? You don't need to make oaths and vows and I swear I cross my heart and hope to die, stick a needle in my eye. You don't need to say things like that. Your word should be good enough. The psalmist wrote in Psalm 89 verse 34, my covenant I will not break nor alter the word that has gone out of my lips. On Wednesday night, we're going through the book of Genesis. And right now, we're last week, we looked at Jacob and his experience with his uncle Laban. Remember what Laban did? Could you rely on Laban's word? His yes ended up being a no. He altered the word out of his mouth. He broke his agreement. So that is a very... Uh, dangerous thing to do and it really reveals a lack of character so we should be able to take other people at their word people should be able to depend on us uh, whatever happened to that all you need is a man's word and a handshake whatever happened to that now I know Dr. Fauci has said we should never shake hands ever again but you know what uh, and by the way, you can shake my hand anytime. Just do it at your own risk, all right? <laughs> but that aside, a handshake aside, people should be able to take us at our word. But we live in a time where dishonesty is, is so common, and people not only lie, they will make vows and, and break them with complete disregard for the God of heaven. And this is just simply the world we live in. And we're so used to it at this point, it just seems normal. Well, it shouldn't be that way. As Christians, especially as Christians, we should be people of our word. And we should keep our commitments, fulfill our commitments. And if we simply do that, you know what's going to happen? We're going to stand out. And that's going to be a good testimony. Just consider this, we all want people to come to Christ. And when we have the opportunity, hopefully we are all sharing Christ with someone else. But if we have a reputation or develop a reputation where we don't keep our word, where we don't fulfill our commitments, if people know that that's the 
kind of guy I am or the kind of woman you are, when you try to witness to them and tell them of, of Christ, how likely are they going to be to listen to you? It's not very likely. So we need to keep our word. You remember in Acts chapter 6 when the apostles uh, chose what many believe to be the first deacons. Do you remember the characteristics they were looking for? The first thing that is said, the apostles said, seek out from among you seven men of what? Good reputation. Okay, so we should have a good, honest reputation. Now, sometimes things will happen and you will make a, a commitment that you're unable to fulfill. And when you do that, you try to make it right. You try to explain to the person what happened. That's what Paul did. He did change his plan. Uh, he didn't just flake out. He had a reason for it. And now he's trying to explain to the church what that reason was. Uh, was So Paul did not treat things lightly. We read that. He said, did I do this lightly? And it's a rhetorical question. The answer is no. And what is he doing? These are his interactions with the church. I will come to the church. I will be there. And then he wasn't there. So he tried to explain to them and make that right. And let me just say this. This isn't just about church leaders. Certainly church leaders have an even greater responsibility to keep their word and their commitments. But this goes really for all members of a local church. Uh, here's one way this might play out in a local assembly. And this is not a you know, commandment, of course, but if a, a member misses church on Sunday, oftentimes they will come to maybe me or one of the deacons and say, hey, next week, you know, I'm not going to be here and here's why I'm going on vacation or whatever. Or if somebody misses church, they might let us know, well, I, you know, I had this commitment and I'm letting you know why I wasn't here. You know what that does? It shows character. It shows commitment. It shows that people don't treat the house of God lightly. And that is very, very important. So another thing about commitments and dependability, there are so many things around any given church, but this church, there are so many things that just, they need to get done. There are uh, different um, roles and responsibilities, jobs around the church. and. As the pastor, it's such a blessing to know that there's people in these roles and the things that need to get done, you know what? They just end up getting done. You never have to worry about it because the people in those positions, they just do their job and they do it joyfully and they're serving the church and they're serving Christ. And you know what God will do? God rewards people for their faithfulness. And we praise God for all those people that are dependable and do all that it takes to make a church uh, operate. If you ask any pastor, and I've had enough conversations with pastors, I know this is true, but if you ask any pastor, one of the most important things for any church is to have a core group of people who love the Lord and serve the Lord, you know where they're going to be on Sunday morning. They serve and the job they do, they do it and they do it well. That is one of the greatest blessings for any pastor, any board of deacons or elders, any church leadership. And we certainly have that here at this church. And I'm thankful for that. Are the deacons thankful for that? Amen. Say amen. amen. If you are, amen. All right, so uh, turn back to 2 Corinthians chapter 1. Being dependable in all areas of life, being dependable in the church, at work, amongst family, friends, so, so important. So up until this point, we've been talking about people and how we should be dependable. And Paul was dependable. But now let's talk about God, that God is dependable. We all know this, people make mistakes at times, people will let you down, but God never does that. If God let you down, the problem is with you, not, not with God, okay? God will never let us down. He keeps his promises. Look at 2 Corinthians 1 verse 19. For the Son of God, Jesus Christ, who was preached among you by us, by me, Silvanus, that's just another word for Silas, and Timothy, 
was not yes and no, but in him was yes. And this is the verse, for all the promises of God in him are yes, and in him, amen, to the glory of God through us. So what does this mean? It means that God, God is faithful. God will always do what he says he's going to do. God keeps his promises. And in time past, in the Old Testament scriptures, a lot of promises were made, right? God said a lot of things. He made a lot of promises. And every one of those promises is fulfilled in Christ. So let's look at an example of this. Turn to Genesis chapter 11, or excuse me, Genesis chapter 12. Genesis 12, and as you're turning there, just think of this word promise. What comes to mind, particularly in the Old Testament when you hear the word promise? Well, you may think of the, the child of promise, that God made a promise. He made a covenant with Abraham that even though he was old and his wife was barren and well beyond childbearing age, God promised a son to Abraham. And this concept of promise is brought into the New Testament and it's tied in with salvation itself. Don't miss this. That a person is saved by faith. What does that mean? By believing the promises of God. In the Old Testament, they knew nothing about the name of Jesus or even him dying on a cross and rising the third day. They didn't know about that. They didn't have those details. So how are they saved? By believing the promises of God. And Christ is the fulfillment of the promises of God. So in Christ, we find the culmination of the promises. So there was the son of promise. What's the other big one that everyone knows? The promise what? The promised land. All right, well, let's look at Genesis 12, starting in verse 1. Now the Lord had said to Abram, Get out of your country, from your family, and from your father's house, to a land that I will show you, and I will make you a great nation, and I will bless you and make your name great, and you shall be a blessing. And I will bless those who bless you, and I will curse him who curses you. And in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. So you answer these questions, okay? Did these things come to pass? Did the Lord make Abraham a great nation? What's the answer to that? Yes. Was his name made great? Yes. Was Abraham a blessing? Yes. Did God bless him and curse his enemies? Yes. Has all the earth been blessed by Abraham? Remember, Jesus is the seed of Abraham. Sure. Yes. yes. All right, so... Final question, did Abraham possess the land? No. No. <laughs> All right, well, now let's go to Hebrews chapter 11. He did dwell in the land, but he did not possess the land. So Abraham did not possess the land. He dwelt in the land as a pilgrim. Okay? Technically, the only part of the promised land Abraham ever owned was the cave at Machpelah. That was his own burial plot where he buried his wife, Sarah. That was the only part of the promised land he ever owned. So does that mean the promises of God failed? No. Well, you know, you know the answer to that. Well, let's look at Hebrews 11. It starts out in verse 1, faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Was Abraham a man of faith? Yes. yes. Look at verse 8, Hebrews chapter 11, verse 8. By faith, Abraham obeyed when he was called to go out to the place which he would receive as an inheritance. And he went out, not knowing where he was going. By faith, he dwelt in the promised land as in a foreign country, dwelling in tents with Isaac and Jacob, the heirs with him of the same promise. For he waited for the city which has foundations, whose builder and maker 
is God. Now skip to verse 13. The author of Hebrews recognizes this. What does he say? All these died in faith, not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off, were assured of them and embraced them and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. For those who say such things declare plainly that they seek a homeland. And truly, if they had called to mind that country from which they had come out, they would have had opportunity to return. But now they desire a better, that is, a heavenly country. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared a city for them. So how is the promise of the land fulfilled in Christ? Well, that's a good question. I'm glad you asked that. <laughs> well, number one, through the salvation that Jesus purchased, Abraham, he got a better country. He got a heavenly country. Right now, his spirit is dwelling with the Lord in that heavenly country. Amen. But not only that, when Jesus returns, what's going to happen? The dead will be raised. And Abraham and his godly descendants will rule and reign upon the earth, dwelling in the land. So in Christ, Abraham is doubly blessed. Not only does he get the earthly country, which he will inherit, he gets the heavenly country. Why? Because all the promises of God in Christ are yes and in him, amen. And what does the word amen mean? So be it. It's true. You know, when Jesus said, truly, truly, I say to you, some versions say, amen, amen, I say to you, verily, verily, it's true. Or when someone says something, you say, amen, you're saying, I agree. That is, that is true. And just in case you're wondering where you fit in, we're going to talk about Abraham and, and David. And you say, okay, these promises were made to them. God promised uh, to Abraham and to his seed. The seed singular is Jesus. The seed plural, you think, well, that's the Jews. Where do we fit in to all of this? Well, if you remember the scripture reading from this morning, what did it say? That if you belong to Christ, then you are. Abraham's seed Amen. and heirs according to the promise. This is your inheritance as well if you have faith in Christ. So not only does the Lord keep his promises, when he delivers, he delivers above and beyond what people expect. Amen. 1 Corinthians 2 verse 9 says, I hath not seen nor ear heard, nor hath entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for them that love him. However you think of the promises of God, and you think of how great they are, you know what? They're even better than you can possibly imagine. Now let's look at uh, another example of the promises being fulfilled in Christ. Turn to 2 Samuel chapter 7. 2 Samuel chapter 7, and we will look at the covenant that God made with David. So we've looked at the Abrahamic covenant, now we'll look at the Davidic covenant, where God makes a promise to King David, and if you didn't already know, you may have figured out by now that the, the term covenant and promise are really synonyms. So a covenant is a promise, or a binding promise. Agreement. So we could say this, that all the covenants of God are fulfilled in Christ. Now look at 2 Samuel chapter 7, starting in verse 1. The scripture says, Now it came to pass when the king, that's David, was dwelling in his house, and the Lord had given him rest from all his enemies all around, that the king said to Nathan the prophet, See, now I dwell in a house of cedar, but the ark of God dwells inside tent curtains. So you can imagine this. David has this amazing uh, palace, and the ark of the covenant is where the Lord dwelled. He's off in this little tent. David didn't feel right about that. 
Verse 3, Then Nathan said to the king, Go and do all that is in your heart, for the Lord is with you. And you remember that David was the second king in Israel, right? Who is the first king? Saul. Saul. And Saul ended poorly, didn't he? Yes. yes, he did. He not only ended poorly throughout, he had some good moments, but Saul willfully at times disobeyed God. David, however, was what? A man after God's own heart. Amen. What does that mean? David wanted what God wanted. David wanted to see the Lord glorified. Who did Saul want to see glorified? Yes, Saul wanted to see Saul glorified. So uh, now David wants to build a house for God. He wants to build a temple. And we know that ultimately it was the Lord's will for his son Solomon to build the temple. But look what happens. And I, I love this. This is an amazing thing. Nathan the prophet is speaking for God. He says in verse 11, the Lord tells you that he will make you a house. So this starts out with David wanting to build a house for God. And God says, no, David, I'm going to build you a house, a dynasty, an everlasting kingdom where David's throne would be established and one of his descendants would sit upon the throne forever. Look at verse 12. When your days are fulfilled and you rest with your fathers, I will set up your seed after you who will come from your body and I will establish his kingdom and he shall build a house for my name and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever and I will be his father and he shall be my son. If he commits iniquity, I will chasten him with the rod of men and with the blows of the sons of men. But my mercy shall not depart from him as I took it from Saul, whom I removed from before you. Now, there's something you got to pay attention to here. In one sense, the Lord is speaking about Solomon. And we know that because he says what? If he commits iniquity. So in a sense, the Lord is speaking about establishing Solomon's throne. However, remember the title of the message, all the promises of God are fulfilled in who? In Christ. Verse 16. And your house and your kingdom shall be established forever before you. Your throne shall be established forever. So if that is true, and we believe the promises of God are true, if that is true, if the throne is established forever, and a descendant of David is on the throne right now, who would it be? It would be Christ. Luke chapter 1, verse 31, the angel Gabriel says to Mary, and behold, you will conceive in your womb and bring forth a son and shall call his name Jesus, and he will be great, and he will be called the son of the highest, and the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. Why? Because all the promises of God in him are yes and amen. You know, one of the most rewarding things about not just reading the Bible, but studying the Bible. Amen. One of the most rewarding things is to see how it all fits together and how Christ is at the center of everything. Amen. One last example. Turn to Jeremiah chapter 31. So, well, where I don't, where's Jesus in the pages of the Old Testament? He's everywhere. You just need to look a little closer. Jeremiah chapter 31. And of course, we could talk about how the Old Covenant, the law of Moses, even that was fulfilled in Christ. Jesus said in Matthew 5 17, Do not think that I came to destroy the law. Or the prophets, I did not come to destroy, but to do what? Fulfill. Fulfill. And in Galatians 3.24, Paul explains how the purpose of the law was to bring people to Christ. Amen. The law shows people their need for a Savior. Because when you look at the commandments, you realize 
I've broken the commandments. And they lead a person to Christ in the forgiveness that he offers. Mm. Now, one of the things, let me just say this about the old covenant. It was different than these other covenants. Why? Because it was temporary. And it was conditional. The old covenant was conditional upon the Israelites keeping it. Now, did they keep up their end of the, of the bargain? Uh, no, they did not. We're going to read about that. But the Old Testament contains three great unconditional covenants. We've looked at two of them, the Abrahamic covenant, the Davidic covenant, and now finally we will look at the new covenant. Jeremiah 31, starting in verse 31. Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt, my covenant which they broke, though I was a husband to them, says the Lord. But this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my law in their minds and write it on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. No more shall every man teach his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me from the least of them to the greatest of them, says the Lord. For I will forgive their iniquity and their sin I will remember. How long? No more. If you are part of the new covenant, your sins are not remembered. They are done away with. And how are these sins going to be forgiven? How is the covenant going to be brought about? Through the blood of Christ. Because all the promises of God are what? Fulfilled in Christ. In him they are yes and amen. Matthew 26 verse 28 says, this is Jesus speaking, For this is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. This is the only hope of heaven. This is the only hope. This is the promise of God that he made with mankind, a promise that he will keep, that if a person would repent and place their faith in the blood of Christ for the forgiveness of sin, they will be delivered from the day of judgment and not only delivered, there's an inheritance waiting, the kingdom, an inheritance in the kingdom of God. But you need to know, this is not just a one-time decision. I think this is the problem with evangelicalism historically, that people have it in their mind that this is a one-time decision. It's true, we do make a decision in a moment of time. But it's not just a one-time decision. It is a lifelong decision. Amen. And I trust that everyone listening to this message has either made that decision or is continuing to make that decision day by day. Or if somebody hasn't made that decision to follow Christ, they will do it before they leave. Do it right now. And just resolve in your heart, I am going to follow Christ. Amen. Not just right this moment and then you get in your car and drive down the road and two hours from now you're just not really feeling that same emotion. It's now, it's later, it's tomorrow, it's next week, it's next month, it's next year. We make that decision to do what? To believe, to obey, and to follow him day after day. Now go back to 2 Corinthians, and that is where we will close. Going back to what the Lord told Jeremiah, you may have noticed what he said, that part of the new covenant is where God, instead of writing his law on tablets of stone, that's what he did to Moses, the Ten Commandments were two tablets of, of stone. What does God do in the new covenant? He writes his law where? 
in the hearts of men. How does he do that? You know, the thing that sets the new covenant apart, there's several things, but I think one of the major factors setting the new covenant apart is the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. It is the Holy Spirit who assures us that we are indeed children of God. It is the Holy Spirit who changes our hearts. It is the Holy Spirit who guides us into all that is true. See, God is dependable. He keeps his covenant. He keeps his promises. And now in the new covenant, we can depend on God, the Holy Spirit, that he is the guarantee that God has saved us and he will keep us saved. You know, it's great that God saves people, but if he can't keep them saved, what good is it? This is the thing about people who believe your salvation can be lost. It looks like sometimes people lose their salvation. They're saved, they love God, they're in church, and then five years later, they're gone, they don't care. To us, it can look like people lose their salvation. That is not the case. It just proves they were never actually saved to begin with. But really, what good would it be if God saved a person, but God was unable to keep them saved? 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 21 and 22. Now he who establishes us with you in Christ and has anointed us is God, who also has sealed us and given us the Spirit in our hearts as a guarantee. Say the word guarantee. Guarantee. Yeah. guarantee. Notice. Also, there are no first and second class citizens in the kingdom. Uh, sometimes you'll hear, especially um, TV preachers, you'll hear, this man is anointed. We have an anointed teacher of God. Have you heard this? Yeah. yeah. Our pastor is anointed. But what do they mean by that? That he's higher up than everybody else. You know, there's the haves and the have nots. That is totally... Totally unbiblical. What does the scripture say? Verse 21. Now he who establishes us. Who's us? Who's he writing to? Believers. Believers in the Corinthian church. They had a few problems. If you didn't know that already. He who establishes us. With you in Christ. And has anointed us. Is God. So what's the point? Every believer is anointed. Every believer is anointed. Anointed means to be set apart. You're consecrated. You now belong to God. In the Old Testament, when someone was anointed, what would they do? They'd take a, a horn of oil and pour it on their head. We talked about David. When David was anointed king, what happened? Samuel poured oil on his head. What is the oil symbolic for? The Holy Spirit. So if you are saved and you have the indwelling Holy Spirit within you, you are anointed. Forget the anointed televangelist. You're anointed. All God's people are anointed, set apart unto God. And what does he do? What does the Holy Spirit do? It says he seals us. And it is a what? Guarantee. Guarantee. Ephesians 4 verse 30. Do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed until you mess up? No. no. Sealed until the day of redemption. So the Holy Spirit has been given to us as a seal, as a guarantee that we belong to God. And because God is our Father, what's the symbolism there? As a Father, He will love us and He will provide for us, and he has made provision in his son, in Christ Jesus. For in him, all the promises of God are yes and amen. Let's close in prayer. Father, how thankful we are that you keep your word. Heaven and earth may pass away, but your word and your promises endure forever. If you say, Lord, that we have eternal life, we have eternal life. We know it's true. If you say we have been forgiven, then we know it's true. And if you say that you love us, we know it's true. And if anyone has never trusted in the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ, may they do that now by faith.
so that they can rest in you and in your promises, both now and throughout eternity. And I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, if anyone has made that decision, I would encourage you to come uh, talk to me or one of the deacons afterward, and we will um, discuss with you your new life in Christ. And the next step is what? <laughs> Baptism, church membership. These are, these are the things that God requires and asks of his people. Let's close with a hymn. Hymn number 342. Please stand, hymn number 342, Just As I Am.